Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I am Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Today, Craig and I are going to talk about who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. But first, let's do some theater folk news. Has another month already gone by? It's now time for our October newsletter. It came out yesterday. And uh, this month we have a uh, issue that is an ongoing series. We do it twice a year. It's called What's New at Theater Folk and focuses on the new plays in our catalog. And frankly, the series is is one of my favorites because uh, the authors of the new plays talk about they are new plays. Um, when I'm, when I've got something new, I think it's really interesting to sit down and sort of share the journey of the play. You know, where did the idea come from? What changes happened during the writing? How did audiences react? What advice would you, you know, give to a, a director taking on the play? I just, uh, I love it mostly because the journey of a play is never a straight line. It's really never from goes from A to B. And to just sort of ponder on that and kind of look back and go, oh, yeah, I started here and then I ended up here. And for those of us who uh, are interested in theater, I think that is very interesting. Oh, wow. That was uh, what a great sentence that was. <laughs> and I, mostly I... I I really, I don't like being put on the spot in like a interview kind of way with those kind of questions, mostly because I, my brain goes to la la land and I never give the answer that I really wished I could give. And in this scenario, I'm sending out the questions to the, uh, the playwrights. It's something that they can do on their own time. And then I'm always so grateful and thrilled by what they send back. So get our newsletter spotlight and gain some insight into these fantastic new plays. Uh, Rebootalization by Alan Hanel, Storied, and The Baloney, The Pickle, The Zombie, and Other Things I Hide from My Mother, both by Bradley Walton. And we had a very interesting discussion with Bradley about changing that baloney title. We were like, come on, you know, really? Do we need to be this kitschy with this title? And we wanted him to change it, and he convinced us thoroughly uh, to leave it the way it is. So read, and he'll explain what he kind of said to us and how he believes in his title, and that's really all I care about. Uh, also, we've got The Bottom of the Lake by Stephen Stack, and Epic Adventures in a Rinky Dink Art Museum by Ken Puris. Lastly... Where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. And you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search on the word theater folk. Episode 12, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Craig and I were in New York last week, and we chose to see the new Broadway remount of Edward Albee's play. When it opens on October 13th, it will have been 50 years from the original production, which I think qualifies it then. I was trying to think if uh, I should call this a classic play or an iconic play. I think it's iconic and classic. Aha, see, both. For those of you who don't know the story, Who's Afraid of, Vir Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, takes place in New England at a small university. Think lots of wood. It's two in the morning, and an older couple, George and Martha. Martha is the, the daughter of the president of the university, and George is uh, in the history department, not... Not the history department. Not the history department. He's just in the history department. Invite a younger couple, uh, a young up-and-coming biologist and his... Uh, wife. Often vomiting wife, uh, who come over for drinks. And suffice it to say that uh, all hell breaks loose. Yeah? Yeah. Um, the other thing of note, too... 
that was fantastic at the first uh, intermission, we were sitting chatting and I, I looked and you're in New York and you tend to recognize people. And I saw this man walking down the, uh, the aisle and, uh, wasn't it Edward Albee? And that was, that, that was probably the coolest thing I've ever, forget the play. I thought that was the coolest thing just to be <laughs> sitting there watching this play with El, 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 um, with Edward Albee. With the guy who wrote it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Craig the, did a little drama geek thing and posted it on Facebook and everybody was like, what? Oh, that's so cool. So let's talk about, first of all, so the first line of the play is Martha walks in and she says, what a dump. Yes. So let's talk about what we saw when we sat down in the theater. Well, yeah. The the first line of the play is what a dump. She's trying to remember the line from a, a movie, a, a Betty, movie, Davis. Betty Davis movie. movie. And, uh, but certainly they kind of do live in a dump. Um, it's, it's a, it's a place that clearly is a beautiful, uh, New England house. Um, lots of, uh, beautiful rich woods, beautiful wainscoting, staircase. staircases, but clearly the place has not been maintained. There are piles of books on the floor, in the fireplace, on tables, surfaces everywhere. There, there is clearly uh, water damage on the walls that has never been uh, fixed. There are signs or, or uh, paintings on the wall that have, you know, just become a little twisted and no one has ever bothered to put back. I imagine it's very dusty too. Yes, it looks dusty. It looks like people don't clean. There were, the, there was a caftan and pillows just strewn about the sofa. And so they're, they're expecting another couple to come over and clearly there is no they they don't do what most people do when someone else is coming over is tidy things up a little bit. The place is quite quite a mess. Array. Yeah, and you also you also notice a uh, a drink cart that is completely stacked full of uh, bottles of alcohol, and that factors well into the play later. Well, it's pretty amazing how just as a pure acting tool, I was in a a. a, a an, adjudic- an adjudication course. And this is the one of the things that was that the adjudicator uh, who was teaching us brought up, you know, how do actors handle their circumstances? And if there are circumstances such as the fact that uh, actors or sorry, characters drink throughout the play, does that affect them? Or do they get drunk? Or do they physically change? And I have to say, this is this was one of the most um, really wonderful performances of being affected by a situation. I think that of there are four characters, the two older and the two younger. And in a lot of productions, the two younger sort of get short shrift. It's really the George and Martha show. And uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's written that way, and I think it's yes. a natural thing. Like a show like this is normally done at um like a, you know a, a strong regional theater company. Well, it should be done at a strong regional theater company. And so the two older actors are are going to be the 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 strongest performers that they have available, and the two younger actors are not going to be as experienced. Well, and I have to say that the two younger actors in this show were phenomenal. Um, and half, of, and a lot of that goes to th- them, uh, reacting to their situation. As they, as the evening goes on, they drink and they drink and they drink some more. And George and Martha, who obviously do this all the time, are affected pretty, very little by it. But the change that comes over the two younger ones is, uh, amazing. Uh, Carrie Coon, who plays Honey, I think she was just a freaking fantastic physical actor. Like she, I could have watched her all night just by the way that she just um, tried to maintain instead of acting drunk, she just tried to maintain and the way that she was unable to hold her head up and the way that she held, she twisted her feet underneath her. And in, there was so much of her part, which was played in silence. And yet she was uh, in the play just as much as the other characters from beginning to end. Yes, you meet George and Martha uh, first in the play, and they're quite strong, dominant characters. And so when the younger couple arrives, <laughs> well, for me, when I see this play, I always hope that the George and Martha, are, or sorry, Nick and Honey are as good as as the performers playing George and Martha. And I was a little bothered when they first came on stage because because Honey was quite 
loud when she came on. She was much louder than than anyone else. And I thought, oh my goodness, this poor girl doesn't have control of herself. And of course, I was totally sucked in because she doesn't have control of herself because she's a little bit drunk and she she can handle her alcohol the least of everyone. Mm -hmm. So she's a little bit she's a little bit drunk. And when people are drunk, they're not quite as aware of their volume. And then Nick, who is the 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 young upstart biologist, which in itself, I think is a little bit funny, who is obviously a, a football player in his in his past who just comes across as the the youth will take over the world kind of attitude when very tied done up and he he sits very upright and he crosses his legs and you know he's kind of like I'm going to take over this town and then he just sort of disintegrates you know his um, his posture gets laxer and laxer. His clothes become just more and more in disarray. And Craig, uh, you thought that you indicated it, and I got a hick accent halfway through. Yes, I, know. I, I thought, I thought later on as he got drunker that he was started to betray an accent that he had been trying to cover up. You know, when people get drunk, then they start to reveal more of what they've been trying to hide. And I don't know if that was just my imagination, but I like to believe that that's what the actor was doing. Okay, so now let's talk about another thing that happens quite often with this play is that it is very violent. It's got violence, it's got physical violence, and it also has verbal violence. And one of the, the oh, a horrible um, misconception and problem when, with sometimes when dealing with a play that is so fraught is that actors dive in at 11 from moment one and then there's nowhere for them to go and this production really handled i'm gonna say they handled it incredibly well and then i think there were a, a bit of a misstep first of all so the f first act was by far uh the funniest virginia wolf i've ever seen one would think it was a comedy by the number of laughs in the first act um, and at intermission, I think we talked about how, how actually nice that was and how, how, how nice it was that they were measured and they, they, they took their time and they didn't uh, dive into it right away. But I felt that I, I felt when we got to the second act, there were a f more than one reference to the yelling in the first act and there wasn't any yelling in the first act. So I actually felt that that was a bit of a misstep not to go to some dark place a little bit in the first act because the play does go to dark places very rapidly in the second Second act and darker in the third act, and I, and they never quite went far enough for me. I never felt the, um, I never felt that anything dangerous could happen. Now, now, having said that, we went to the show with another couple, and the the woman in the couple, she did feel that something could go awry at any second. Yes, I'm speaking for myself. So, we're, yes, yeah. we're only speaking for ourselves. Now, and there's quite a lot of mention too. Honey, at, at one point in the second act, she, I think George goes after Martha to strangle her and Honey is basically jumping up on the on the couch she, shouting, violence, violence, violence. <laughs> and I just, and I felt that the because the verbal violence had been tempered, the physical violence came out of nowhere. Now, see, we, and, and then I have to say... Yeah, but oh, but I just I really enjoyed that first. I really enjoyed that first act. Me so. too. I enjoyed the fact that it wasn't it wasn't screamy. So I, I think you just have to give it that. Yeah, I I, I felt that um, one really interesting thing is that when you're looking at violence and in, in in terms of relationships, uh, these two couples are are also in in their varying ways. They're very they have differing violences in their in their relationship. And it really kind of came across that this was kind of a love story for George and Martha, a very bizarre love story, but that they, they like the fight. They like the violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it, that at the end of the day, when the two couples wake up and then the next morning, that George and Martha will go and on and have coffee and everything will be hunky dory and Nick and Honey will never be the same again. <laughs> no, no, their lives are devastated. Uh, a friend of mine said when I when I told him we were going to see this show, he he, he said um, he said when it's done right, you should feel like you've been punched in the stomach at the end. I don't think I felt I punched in the stomach I at the end, that. but I di I did. I, at the end, I remember, I remember feeling, wow, that was amazing. Well, it was like we were eavesdropping on relationships. That's what I felt. And I think that's the mark of an excellent production. Yeah. I felt like I was, I felt like I was kind of sitting in that room quietly observing. I, I, I didn't feel like I was watching a play. I felt like I was, I was spying on, on something I shouldn't be seeing. And that is 
a fantastic experience to have in the theater. So Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? One of the great things about being able to see it is that it's the type of play that will never exist again. It is a three-act play. Um, you know, when most of shows these days are running 90 mit- minutes without intermission, can you imagine a 90-minute version of this play? No. No, not with not with the same kind of impact. And I, it, it's so funny because I think if someone wrote this exact same play today, it's three acts, three hours long. With lots of stuff that doesn't seem to drive... I think it all drives the story personally because you learn about the characters, but but there's stuff that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the the, the why they're there. Yeah, if you're only obsessed with uh, the actual story that happens, you could cut swaths and swaths. But to what end? <laughs> to what end? There's all, the writing is is beautiful, but I I don't I don't think this play could ever be written and produced today. It'll be produced forever because it's a classic. But it could never. No one could ever write a play of this kind of scale. And and I think that one of the things that I I also thought in seeing it, aside from the mention of a of a telegram. It, it, it's not dated, you know, like I did not feel that I was, if they had been wearing modern clothes, I wouldn't have been miffed. Yeah. I think the telegram was the only, only thing that was really put it in any kind of a time period. It seemed, it seemed timeless, especially said in a, in a New England college where, you know, these colleges and universities never, never really evolve. They never change. <laughs> And the, okay, so the last thing we'll talk about is the fact that when you've got something like this that is a classic that has been uh, portrayed by uh, maybe some some very classic iconic actors, uh, there's a there's you certain know, expectations. Yeah, I think. you want to compare. Well, some people want to compare the the boys who were sitting behind us at the show were very obsessed with. Uh, uh, you know what? We never said the name of the actress, Craig. Uh, Tracy Letts, who is a, a very, very well-known uh, playwright. He was George. Uh, Amy Morton was uh, Martha. Carrie Coon was um, Honey. And we, Craig, is frantically searching through for the name of Nick Madison Dirks. And uh, the the gentlemen behind us were obsessed with how with with how Tracy Letts portrayed his. George, and that they didn't like it, and that they were much more, they remembered the way Richard Burton did it in the movie, I believe it was in the movie with uh, Elizabeth Taylor, and, and liked that much more. And I personally, I loved Tracy Letts as George, I thought it was a perf- I thought it was a very pitch-perfect attempt, and I also liked Amy Morton's Martha. I, I really felt that these two played this as a relationship, as a couple, but, you know, there's lots of people who were going to compare. And, uh, Craig, you read something really, really great about Tracy Lessons- Letts' response to that comparison. Yeah, two things I found um, just referring to their rehearsal process. Uh, I should say that this was uh, originally mounted at Steppenwolf in Chicago and then transferred to uh, Washington, D.C. and is now just uh, just opening on Broadway. Uh, there were two things I found that was that was a really good insight, I think, and it, it really um, really helpful for anyone who's approaching a play or uh, any kind of piece of work that that's classical and uh, iconic and has you know uh, I- classic iconic uh, versions of it that people always evoke in their minds and and what they clearly did and what everyone should clearly do is forget what uh, you've seen and and just rebuild from the ground up. I'm not saying that you want to do, you know, a crazy new interpretation. I'm saying you should do an interpretation that comes from the company that's that's doing the show. So t- just two quick quotes. Uh, one is from what's her name, Carrie Coon, uh, who played Honey. Uh, she said that um, uh, she said that uh, Amy Morton and Tracy Letts told her this. She told that they told her not to approach it as an iconic play, but just as another script. And I and I think that's exactly how you have to approach it. And, and then I have another quote from uh, Tracy Letts. He says when we he says when we sit down to work on a show at Steppenwolf, the approach is the same. You start on page one. Uh, try to figure out who these people are, what they want, and how they get it. Simple questions. And then we fill in the blanks. There was never any discussion during rehearsal about, it's normally done this way, but we're going to do it this way. We never talked about it in those terms. We just talked about real people. So when it comes out in the wash that this is a very different George or a very different dynamic, I sort of go, no, really? It doesn't feel like it to me when I'm up there. 
I think that's the way to approach any kind of text, any text, really. What's the point of doing it if you're going to try and copy, copy some other performance? There's no point. Just go without, just watch a movie. Exactly so. So uh, I'll, uh, we're really, really pleased that we were able to have seen this production. Steppenwolf has a, that was another reason why we chose it, because it was uh, Steppenwolf. And I, I've seen a couple of their shows and have just loved how they approach work. And there's nothing more satisfying than, than seeing a, oh, just a solid show with just, uh, where obviously everyone is working towards a, the same goal. And that is to give us a theatrical experience. And that's what I felt I got. And to tell a story and to draw us into the characters. Go into a world. Simple stuff. Excellent. Thanks, Craig. You're welcome, Lindsay. Mm -hmm.